If you're installing a 1G engine block into a 2G chassis like I am, irregardless of whether it's a 6-bolt or a 7-bolt block, there's a few things that aren't interchangeable without modification. Because this can be messy, it's a good idea to have all this sorted out prior to your final cleaning and assembly. The primary issue with doing this generational swap is getting the timing side engine mount stuff to fit. The 1G water pump is a different shape and it interferes with where the timing mount bolts up. There's lots of different ways that people have solved this problem, but the method I'll demonstrate today has to be the easiest. Here we've got from left to right a 1G timing mount and a 2G timing mount. Both are cast iron and you see they're a different shape. To make this as simple as possible for yourself, use the timing mount that's the same generation as the car you're installing it into. The front case you use should be the same generation as the block. That makes all the oil galleries line up and it prevents having to get anything machined. Here I'm using blue painters tape to mark off the block so that I can trim around the parts and make a template for what I have to cut. Blue painters tape is nice because it's not acidic, doesn't leave adhesive behind, peels off easily and offers a great contrast for the camera so you can see what I'm doing. I need to access the bolt holes so I'm going to cut those out first. Next I trim around the water pump with an X-Acto knife. The block is tougher than the blade so don't worry about scratching the block. It won't hurt anything. Now we remove the water pump and install the timing mount, doing the same thing with the tape. I left the 2G tensioner arm on the timing mount when I took apart my 7 bolt, and it really doesn't need to be in this video because I'm not using it. At this point we can start peeling the tape to see where these parts overlap. With the water pump tape removed, remove the timing mount and peel the section that doesn't overlap. What's left is the tape negative of what needs to be cut out. It's a negative because the adhesive is on the wrong side to stick it to the timing mount. The differences are pretty obvious here, but there's lots of similarities as well. The milled surfaces for the idler pulley are the same thickness and the holes are in the same spot. This makes sense because all 4G63s use the same service parts for a timing belt job. There's one less bolt on a 1G timing mount though. Perhaps it's because there are three engine mounts for the block on a 1G, but this one mount is the only engine mount on a 2G. When the 2G was born, Mitsubishi moved the roll stop mounts from the engine to the transmission. On either car they're still within inches of each other, but it's all bolted together. I don't know their reasoning on this. You don't hear about anyone breaking a 1G timing mount because it only has three bolts. However, the 1G mount is a bit burlier than the 2G unit. You can see most of the gussets are cast thicker, but overall they weigh about the same. What I need to do to make the 2G mount fit a 1G block is to mark off and cut a relief to make room for the water pump, and that will wipe out most of this bolt hole right here. All that work we did making the tape negative needs to be turned into a positive so that we have a good template to go by. To do this, carefully peel the tape and stick it to something you can easily cut. I'm using more tape because it's here already. Cut the template out and flip it. Now that the template fits the part, tape up the part and trim around the template. This is handy because it lets you get a clean cut in one shot without having to repeatedly grind and test fit the part. Now that we've got our part mocked up, it's time to start making a mess. Take measures to protect parts from the fallout. I prefer double bagging the block for an extra layer of protection. I'm using blocks of wood to prevent gouging my part and orienting it in the vise so that I can complete the cut without repositioning it. There are plenty of different tools that could be used for this. I've chosen to use an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel because it's fast and easy, but it offers very little precision without careful guidance and relief cuts. Plan your cut angles so that they don't cut too far. Cleaning up the rough stuff is easy once you have the bulk of it out of your way. With the rough cut complete, take a minute to deburr the part and contour it with files. I'm using a 10 inch double cut flat bastard file and a slightly tapered quarter inch round file. The neater you are with the grinder, the less time this takes. Files give you a lot more control to create contours and to make your work look pretty. But if you want your work to look really pretty, when you're done with the files, fire up your angle die grinder with a scotch Bright pad. It'll quickly polish up any marks left by the files. Make sure not to leave any sharp edges or deep gouges behind as they can weaken the part. Here's what I've got. It's a really simple cut. If you take the time to make the template, you won't be repeatedly cleaning parts, walking back and forth from the block, and having to cover it over and over again while you're making a mess. You'll end up with good results the first time and save a lot of effort in the process. There's a cliche in there somewhere, something about measuring and cutting. I forget how it goes exactly, but this is a live demonstration of it. That's a good fit. It's not touching anywhere, and I removed as little material as possible to make room for the water pump. 
I've got about a two and a half millimeter gap in the tightest spots where I cut it out. You should paint or powder coat it once you're done because it'll rust if you don't. Consider the thickness of your coatings. Let's see how this front case fits with the 2G mount. You'll remember in a previous video that we rebuilt this thing, cleaned it, and prepared it for install. When I wrapped this thing up, I left myself a note to torque the oil pump sprocket nut to 29 foot-pounds. Let's go ahead and do that right now while we're at it. I just don't want to forget. If you're using the factory stub shaft from a 1.6 liter, it's ground flat on both sides so you can grab it with something. I'm going to use my vise, but first I'm going to put a couple of rags in the jaws to prevent from marring it up. I've got this thing packed with grease, so I really don't want to turn it or it'll pump out. You can't do this easily without the vise or else you'll never be able to hold it still while you're torquing the nut. But before we torque it, I want to apply red Loctite to it. This also gives us a chance to talk about a necessary factor of every build, your torque wrench. Over time they wear out and they lose their calibration. The cheap ones are worse at this than the expensive ones, and the expensive ones still require calibration from time to time. How they're used and stored has a lot to do with the calibration's longevity. My power built gave up the ghost, and I'm fine with that. It's an $80 torque wrench that I replace annually. If you bought a torque wrench more than a year ago and spent less than 100 bucks on it, go ahead and put a new one in your shopping cart before you even consider starting your assembly. Get a torque wrench that gives you the most accurate means possible for installing all of your parts. Some of them give you feedback, and those are well worth the investment. I was lucky enough to have access to this Snap-on Tech Wrench, and you bet I'll be adding one of these to my toolbox very soon. This torque wrench is digital, which I know bothers some of you, but it's been calibrated within the year and I trust it a lot more than anything else I've got in my toolbox. It's a much more expensive and higher quality torque wrench than what I have. This wrench is nice because you can digitally set your target torque in either nanometers or foot-pounds. It gives you feedback in the form of a beep when you near your target, and it vibrates once you hit it. If you listen carefully, you can hear it vibrate. After you've torqued your bolt, the display reads how much stank you put on it. This is a great addition to the project. Thank you, Chad. You spoiled me. But before I went off on this tangent, we were busy test fitting the front case to see how it fit with the 2G mount. I was overly careful here with leaving the tape below the mount just in case it was a tight fit. But I really didn't need to. There's plenty of clearance in the front case area. The only thing you need to trim is that one bolt hole on the timing mount. With the cut made this way, I can install and remove these parts independently of one another. There's plenty of room for tools to service it, and I can now bolt this 6-bolt block right into my 2G. But we're not really done yet. We've only addressed one of the problems with doing this. In order for your timing cover to fit, other parts will need to be modified as well. For instance, this is a 2G timing cover plate, and it has the same problem as the timing mount because it has the same footprint. If you don't have the one for a 1G and don't feel like buying it, you can just cut this one with a pair of 10 snips so that it fits. The timing cover bolt holes are in the same place and it's the proper fit for either generation's timing cover. I've seen people deal with this in a lot of different ways. I've got both timing covers here. One's for my old 7 bolt in the condition it was in when I took my 7 bolt apart complete with a piece that my cousin stepped on, replaced, and then I promptly stepped on again. The other one's the one that came from this block that required two hours of degreasing and cleanup to make it look like this. This thing was a mess. Oil, grease, and timing belt dust make quite a strange substance. On a 1G, the timing cover extends all the way up to the valve cover. On a 2G, in addition to the upper timing cover, there's also a middle section that bolts to the head, and a lower section that bolts to the block, making it a three-piece timing cover. Mitsubishi did this to simplify the process of removing the timing cover while the engine's in the car. On the 1G timing cover, aside from the bottom edge near the oil pan, only a small area around the water pump looks different. The timing marks and everything else are in the same place. But it's a 4G63. The timing covers are interchangeable, right? Nope. Sorry. Neither one fits a 2G6 bolt swap. The 2G timing cover doesn't fit because of the position of the water pump. And the 1G timing cover doesn't fit because of the 2G timing mount. I'm making this template to line up the 2G cover and mark where the 1G cover will need to be cut. You'll notice I'm not doing a super precision job here. Eyeballing this on cardboard works fine. In order to resolve this, I'm going to use the middle section of a 2G timing cover. You know, the part that bolts to the head. And of course, the 2G upper timing cover. Only the bottom section will be from a 1G, but since it shares space with the 2G parts, I'll be cutting up my 1G timing cover. The 1G cover clears the water pump and I'm going to trim around the timing mount to accommodate what's different. Just remember to leave a little extra on top so that you can trim it into place. Where the lower cover meets the 2G middle cover, these parts overlap so you get a little bit of forgiveness. But if you cut too much off here, you get yourself into trouble. Plastic is much easier to trim than it is to put back on.
I love it when I nail things on the first try. I don't always do that. This looks like it's going to be a great fit, and it should be but for the most part since it's the right timing cover for the block. I'm clear around the timing mount because all of my bolt holes line up and the cover fits flush. This is the first time I've ever had to do this, and I get to figure this out just like the rest of you have. Maybe this will save someone else some time someday. I don't know. I'm not testing the fit with the oil filter housing because I'm using a 1G oil filter housing and I know it will fit. I'm not done with this yet, but I have to stop for now on the lower cover. I need to order new rubber gaskets for both a 1G and a 2G timing cover to do it right, but I don't have the cylinder head here to bolt down the middle cover and make it a perfect fit. I'm fairly certain I won't nail that one if I guess, and I want to make it pretty. You can see the extra meat I left on top because it's supposed to line up even with the metal cover. The overlap part I was talking about earlier, between the lower and the middle covers. It's just a set of grooves that lets one fit over top of the other. There's cutouts for the crank angle and cam angle sensor harnesses, and I'll address those when I clean the rest of it up. But it looks like we can put the timing cover to bed for now. This is just how I'm going to do mine. You may do yours slightly differently. You might make the 1G cover fit and then have to break it in order to do a timing belt job. It's your choice. I don't mind going through a little bit of extra work now if it makes life easier for me later. And this is the point of the build where everyone should be thinking about stuff like that. But wait, there's more. I ordered a 1G tensioner arm for my 2G timing mount. The 2G tensioner won't clear the water pump or the bolts that hold it down. And I mentioned its necessity in my parts video. But this isn't even a 1G tensioner arm like I thought I ordered. I had to spend an hour digging through shelves, boxes, and buckets looking for an old one from a 6 bolts just so I could finish my point. I'm feeling lucky here. In one of my oily parts hoarding buckets, I found it. This is the tensioner arm I have to use with the 2G mount, but I'm not letting this thing get anywhere near my block like this. I have to clean this up first. If you were doing your final assembly, you'd want to pack this journal with grease, but right now I'm just test fitting these parts to make sure I have all the clearance I need. So no lube, we're going in dry. That's the way it's supposed to fit. It doesn't have to travel very far, it just can't be rubbing on anything. If all of your parts are from the same generation, then there's a timing tension or adjustment tool that I showed you in another video that most people find to be very handy. It permits you to compress and lock down the timing tensioner so that you don't have to remove and recompress the hydraulic tensioner when performing timing or valve train jobs. Very useful, huge time saver. But it doesn't fit, not for a 1G and a 2G swap. If you've noticed, so far, everything is the water pump's fault. The timing tensioner tool hits a water pump bolt instead of the 1G tensioner arm. It's there to remind us and it's just laughing at us. This tool is nothing but an M8 by 125 threaded steel rod. All I need in order to use it is another hole. So with everything bolted in place, I'm eyeballing where I think the hole should be to make some marks. I don't know why I'm doing this really. I usually just wind up pulling my engine out of the car more often than a scheduled timing belt service for polishing or maintenance or whatever else, so I've never even used this tool. In fact, I've just bought it for the first time, but it might come in handy for me someday. One commenter suggested it could work with a little bit of modification, so I thought I'd give it a try just in case. I know I can only be but so accurate using hand tools and eyeballing marks, so I'm starting with a small hole, 5.30 seconds. It's sort of like testing a corrosive product on an inconspicuous area. It's an attempt to minimize your mistakes. The reason I do this is because you can correct the angle of a hole that's too small better than you can one that's the right size already. So to check my work before causing too much harm, I'm checking the fit with a brazing rod through the tiny hole I just drilled. If you nail it on the first attempt, then you end up with a great pilot hole to help keep you straight. For an M8 threaded hole, you can use a plain old quarter inch drill bit. It's actually a 64th of an inch smaller than what's recommended for M8 by 125 threads, but you can get away with it on cast iron. I'm cutting the groove to help me get a little bit better clearance for the tool, but most importantly to help line up my approach if I ever have to use this thing. There's two holes here now, and I need to fix that. I don't know that it makes it any weaker or stronger if I fill it, but I don't think it could hurt. I just see it as a superfluous hole that will make the tool harder to use. You could end up in the wrong hole, miss the tensioner, and hit the water pump right in the bolt. It's not really a big problem. You'll know you missed because the belt will stay tight. It's just annoying. I apparently didn't get it perfect because I had to do a tiny little bit of grinding to the timing cover. It looks like it interfered slightly with that and with one of the water pump bolts. It's not perfect, but it'll work. You could actually move the hole out about a sixteenth of an inch so that the tool lines up more on the outside of the tensioner arm. That would help it clear that bolt a little bit better, but since it's too late now, I'll just make room for it instead. 
I'm done with the block for now and it's going out the door, but before I let you go, I'm going to plug this superfluous hole. I found a dirty M8 donor bolt for the car. I gave it a quick polishing on the bench grinder because I don't want to contaminate the hole. I don't need the whole thing, just the tip. I used my nuts to lock it down tight, and then I just put them in the vise. Next I cut the shank just above the nuts, and I used a dremel to make an incision across the butt of the plug so I can just jam a screwdriver in there and get it right in the middle of the hole. There you go, I made a plug. Okay look, I I'm sorry about that dialogue. Every time I see nuts in a vise, it reminds me of Google Plus and what it means for YouTube. I get a little bit distracted because I'm really not happy about it. I'll try to stay focused for all of your sakes. What I'm doing here is pretty much self-explanatory. I threaded the plug halfway into the timing mount so that I have something to weld against. I started off a little too cold on my welding settings, and once I realized that I turned them up and it finished quite nicely. I would have preheated the part except that it's powder coated and I didn't feel like breathing all of that. I didn't feel like spending the time, effort, or money associated with stripping this part first, and I'll be paying someone else to get the coatings right, so I didn't bother doing any of the prep work here. All I'm doing is filling a hole. I'm not the greatest welder, so it took a little bit of grinding to make it look pretty, but that's what grinders are for. Now I just have one more side to do. It's the same process, really. Because it's a tight spot here, a dremel can be very useful, but it's very slow. So I use a carbide burr with an air die grinder in the tight spots because I haven't got all day. Now with the holes filled, I'm removing the rough area caused by the tap so that I don't leave stress rises behind, just smoothing and contouring everything. I spend a little bit of time tapering the hole on the other side to make life easy if I ever have to use this tool. Again, this is just one way of solving this tensioner issue. I'm only doing it here to show that it can be done, and if this is something that you'd like to use someday, this is the part of the build where it's time to do it. The way I'm resolving the clearance for the timing mount bolt will be to torque down the bolt that I'm going to use, mark it, and grind a small section out of the head. I shouldn't need to remove very much, and I'm fine with doing that. If you want to avoid it, now you know how. There's several different ways of dealing with making a 1G block fit into a 2G eclipse. Some people like to grind down the 2G tensioner arm as well as the 1G water pump to give them enough clearance not to interfere with one another. You could do that. I put a link to that method in my description. So let's recap. To put a 1G block in a 2G chassis, you're going to need the matching block, oil pan, water pump, front case, and oil pump assembly. The hydraulic tensioner and bolts, lower timing cover with the rubber gaskets, and the timing belt tensioner arm. The parts you need to complement this from a second generation car are the upper and middle timing covers with both the plastic and the metal parts and the rubber gaskets. I'm using the lower metal timing cover from a 2G trim to fit and also using the 2G timing mount assembly, of course minus the 2G tensioner arm. The fasteners I selected are all dependent of the generation of parts that are bolted down. That means the bolts are from the generation for the parts shown here. That's the part that can be a little bit confusing, so I've put all the part numbers for everything in the description along with specific considerations for your build based on this method. The head you use may have an effect on what fits, but I've tried to make it as simple as possible, and I hope you've enjoyed watching me make all of this stuff fit. The block is going out for its final cleaning now before the coatings begin, and with this preparation done, hopefully the assembly should be a cakewalk. But thanks for tuning in. Like, or plus one, or do whatever the heck YouTube's trying to make us do if you can figure it out. If you're not linked to Google+, Plus, I completely forgive you. Right. I'm still grateful you. for your time. Alright, thank you so much. Cream and sugar, everything. Alright, thank you. Have a good day. You too. Gotta do it. Oh yeah.